Yesterday we started to look at the problem of uh, DC DC conversion that is what it is called. Essentially you have a DC source of uh, some value and you want to get a DC source of a different value from that. Okay. With AC the problem is quite simple you use a transformer with appropriate turns ratio and you can either increase the voltage level or reduce them okay. and there is no loss in the process. You know that what power goes into the primary of the transformer the same thing comes out of the secondary. Uh, there will be some parasitic losses because the coil windings will have some resistance otherwise there is no loss. Okay. So, now we want to do the same for AC and also it is not just a matter of uh, changing the voltage level you could do that by at least decreasing the voltage level can be done using a resistive divider, but these are not just uh, some voltages that we want to measure for some purpose. We want to supply power through these other voltages. Okay. There are different circuits which need different supply voltages and power supplies for these is what we are looking for. We saw that if you do use a resistive divider, if you want the output voltage to be stable that is uh, output voltage to not depend too much on the load current then the current through the voltage divider has to be much more than the load current that is the only way it will work. So, this means that you will dissipate far more power in the resistive divider than what you are supplying to the load. Okay. So, efficiency is far from being 1 or 100 percent will be much much less than 100 percent. Okay. So, we want to use not resistors which are lossy components, but lossless components while making DC DC converters. Okay. Now, of course, there is the additional problem of uh, stabilizing the output voltage to some exact value uh, even if the input battery voltage changes and so on that is the done through negative feedback and that we will worry about later. Okay. So, now let us at least find some way of uh, changing one DC voltage to another without power loss in the process. So, if you do not want to incur any power loss obviously, you have to use lossless components okay. and what lossless components do we know inductors and capacitors. Now, of course, even without doing any further analysis you probably feel that you cannot do much with inductors and capacitors alone. Why is that? The problem is DC DC conversion and if I give you only inductors and capacitors probably you cannot do much. I mean that is my guess that would be my guess why why do I say that. Huh? Yeah I mean after all how did we analyze circuits in the DC case you short circuit inductors and open circuit capacitors pretty much as though they are not there right. So, I mean what is the point of putting inductors when they are anyway going to drop out of uh, the DC picture right. So, similarly for capacitors. So, it is not likely that using only inductors and capacitors you can do anything. You do need other lossless components and what we have what I introduced yesterday which you are familiar with I think is a switch. A switch you can think of as a two terminal element, but whose state is controlled by whose IV characteristics are controlled by a third signal uh, or uh, by a logic signal. Okay. So, that is the switching signal. right? So, you have a logic signal that says whether the switch is on or off. Now, an ideal switch if it is on it behaves like a short circuit between the two terminals. So, that means that the two voltages will be identically equal and similarly uh, when uh, the switch is open it is an open circuit. So, that means that no current will flow from one terminal to the other through the switch. Okay. I mean reality what happens is neither of this is uh, neither of these is exactly true what do you think will happen to the IV characteristics. Yesterday we saw the on switch has uh, uh, the IV characteristic is coincident with the y axis of the IV plane vertical line and that of the off switch is coincident with the horizontal axis of the IV plane. What will happen in reality? There will be a resistance. So, what happens is the ideal switch this is on, this is off. A real switch all that happens is 
it would not have infinite slope here and here it would not have 0 slope that is it will neither be perfectly short circuit nor be perfectly open circuit in the two states, but it will be close to that. Now, we can do lot of analysis by assuming ideal switches and later we can include the effect of the switch resistance if we need to. Okay. So, now this if you think of uh, the terminal voltage and current as the variables that is the terminal uh, the voltage across the two terminals of the switch and the current from flowing from one terminal to the other as variables then it is actually a linear element. The only thing is uh, it is a linear element whose characteristic depends on the logic level. So, if the logic changes with time this becomes a time varying element. Okay. So, what can you do with switches? If you have only R cells and C's, however you connect them you will end up with a what kind of circuit? Linear time invariant circuit. Now, with this you will get a linear time varying circuit. Now, we would not go into any sort of formal analysis of time varying uh, circuits. There is a theory for that just like you have for linear time invariant circuits, but uh, the time varying nature does help us in some way. Okay. Now, how does it help us? One obvious way is because we had a solution for AC, right? we could think of converting DC to AC using switches. Okay. Now, if you uh, what is AC after all? It is some uh, voltage with alternating polarity. Okay. So, you can easily imagine DC uh, by definition the polarity is fixed. So, you can easily imagine switches which will either connect it to a source this way or this way right? alternately. So, that will give you a voltage with alternating polarity. Of course, it will be a, a rectangular wave not a sinusoid, but it is AC after all. So, that can be done. Now, of course, that is not the preferred way we can do other uh, things like we discussed yesterday. So, we took the problem of uh, starting with a higher voltage let us say 3.6 volts or something and getting a lower voltage. Now, what is it that we can do with switches? We cannot get 1.8 volts for sure continuously, but what we can do is uh, arrange the switches such that you get 3.6 volts for some of the time and 0 for the remainder of the time. Okay. Now, what is the average output voltage? It is the fraction of the time for a uh, fraction of the time uh, the output is 3.6 volts. Okay. Sorry, it is the fraction of the time the output is 3.6 times 3.6 volts. Right. So, that and of course, we assume that we do this periodically that is uh, we keep the switch in one state. Let us say we uh, obtain 3.6 volts for some time then 0 for uh, some other duration then again go to 3.6 again 0 and so on we do this periodically. Right. So, we although, although we do not know how to get uh, continuously a different voltage, we can definitely get an average voltage equal to whatever we want. Okay. So, in a I mean similar to a resistive divider in this case the output can only be less than 3.6 right, because if you connect it all the time to 3.6 you will get 3.6, if you connect it all the time to 0 you get 0, if you alternate between them with some duty cycle you get somewhere between 0 and 3.6. Okay. So, let us worry about the other problem later how to increase the voltage, but uh, decreasing the voltage we can do, but uh, once we have got the average voltage that is not enough we need to actually obtain the small voltage that we want let us say 1.8 volts continuously we want a DC of 1.8 volts. Now, the problem looks uh, simpler in that uh, the output voltage of our arrangement was periodic and uh, as you know every periodic signal can be decomposed into its Fourier components. So, it will have some average value which is the what we want plus uh, some uh, sinusoids at the fundamental frequency and all the harmonics. Okay. So, how do we if we do have a bunch of different frequencies how do we select a particular frequency? What do we do? We have to filter it okay. that is the purpose of a filter right. Filter has a frequency dependent behavior. So, that uh, uh, what happens is that you can arrange uh, the filter component such that it selects one particular frequency and then or one range of frequencies and then removes all the rest. Okay. So, that is what we will do. So, we have a source V s let us say this is 3.6 volts it can be anything and we have a load 
R L and across R L we want some V out okay, or V O let us say and we can take this to be 1.8 volts, it can also be anything. So, first we get an average equal to V O whatever it is that we want by an arrangement of switches. This S bar means it is the logical complement of S and S is a signal which S is a periodic signal which looks like this. Okay. It is a periodic signal with a period of T S and the level goes between 0 and 1. Basically, all it says is the switches are being alternately turned on and off and its on duration is alpha T S. In this case, the average will be alpha times V S. Okay. So, we can also control the output voltage, the average output voltage by controlling alpha, the duty cycle of the switching signals. So, next we need a filter and in this case, we know that the spectrum of uh, the signal here, the switch signal, it consists of an impulse at f equals 0 and what is the area of the impulse? It is alpha V s and it also has impulses at in general at f s which is 1 by T s and 2 f s and 3 f s and so on. Okay. All of you are familiar with Fourier series? So, what we want is to retain this alone. So, we have to use a filter like that, so that it cuts off all of these and retains this one and that is a low pass filter. It passes low frequencies and removes all the high frequencies. In this case, we are interested only in DC. Okay. Any questions? Uh, clearly, we do not want to make this uh, filter using resistors, because if you do obviously, then it defeats the uh, goal of having no power loss in the DC DC converter. So, we make it using inductors and I think you are already familiar with the second order LC uh, low pass filter also. So, one of the ways of uh, making a filter at least simple filters is to use two impedances with different frequency dependence. right? So, for instance, if this has a much lower impedance, z 1 is much smaller than z 2 the magnitude for d c then it will pass d c, if it is the other way around it will pass a c and so on. So, how do we make a low pass filter here? We can connect an inductor this way and the capacitor that way. Okay. What will be the transfer function from uh, let me show only the filter. So, I call this V i and call this V o, what is the transfer function? Please evaluate it quickly. What is the order of the transfer function? Huh? Second order. Okay. So, I am not going to work this out. This is the parallel combination of these two divided by parallel combination of that plus S L and you get 1 plus S square L C plus S L by R plus 1. Okay. SL by RL. Okay. So, sanity check obviously, DC gain is 1, the inductor is a short and a capacitor is a, and the capacitor is open and then also another possible sanity check is when RL is infinity. What do you what should what do you expect to happen when RL is infinity? Huh? What do you 
what is that? RL, RL is infinity, the load is infinity. Yeah. Huh? LC oscillator. So, what would you see in the transfer function? So, this goes away. So, you have 1, square, 1 by s square LC plus 1 at s equals j by square root LC, this becomes infinity. Okay. So, you get infinite gain at the resonance frequency, that is what you would see. Anyway, this is quite simple. I think you probably if you play around with enough with it, you will even remember this. Okay. So, anyway, and what will the if I plot the just for practice, if I plot the Bode magnitude plot versus omega, what will that look like? What will be the Bode plot well before? What is the natural frequency of this? What is the natural frequency of the transfer function? Square root of 1 by L c, okay, as you expect. And what is the damping factor or the quality factor? Huh? 1 by 2 R c, no, that uh, does not have the dimensions, uh, correct dimensions. I mean, damping factor or quality factor should be dimensionless. R root C by yeah. what is that? Quality factor. So, quality factor is R L square root of C by L. Okay. It again makes sense and the damping factor is what? 1 over 2 Q, right? So, 1 over 2 R L square root of L by C. So, again you should check if R L is infinity, damping should become 0, right? It does. So, anyway, like what will the Bode plot of this look like? What is the magnitude plot of this look like? What is the value at very low frequencies? 1. Okay. What happens at very high frequencies? No, no, 0 is fine, but uh, Bode plot is uh, plotted on a log log. Huh? It goes down. Finally, only this term matters. It goes down as 1 over omega square. So, it goes down as minus 40 dB per decade. Okay. What happens in the middle? So, first if you go with the strict Bode plot like thing, you would simply connect these two lines, but I think you also know that the Bode plot is not a great approximation when you have complex conjugate poles. It is quite all right when you have all real poles and zeros. Okay. There will be some deviations around the break points, but it is okay. But when you have complex conjugate poles, like much more complicated stuff can happen for uh, q greater than 1 over square root 2 or zeta less than 1 over square root 2, you have peaking, right. You can have stuff like this and depending on how high the quality factor is, the peak can be higher and higher and for uh, quality factor less than that, it can be, it can look more droopy like that, okay. But let us not worry about this. All we want to know is uh, the main thing is that, yeah, we do have a second order a response. So, that means, it is unity at low frequencies 1 over omega square at very high frequencies or minus 40 dB per decade and on top of it, yeah, there can be peaking and what is this frequency around which you see peaking? <laughs> omega n, it is 1 over square root L c. Okay. So, this entirely depends on R L. So, we do not yet know what it is, but uh, this depends on R L and that is what we have to use. And what will the phase look like? Quickly, we don't. We will need all of this eventually to form a negative feedback loop around this and keep it well behaved and so on. What is the phase at very low frequencies? Huh? Zero. What is the phase at very very high frequencies? Minus pi. Okay. So, if you put S equals j omega, you get minus 1 over omega square L c. So, it is pi and then uh, then what? What other critical point can you identify here? And then what is the phase? What 
What is the phase at omega equals 1 over square root L C? Yeah, minus 45. Why? What is it? I mean, you can substitute, right? It may not by V I. S equals J by square root L C. It is minus pi by 2, okay, because the 1 cancels with S square L C at that frequency, you are left with 1 over S L by R and S is J omega. So, you have 1 over J, which is a phase shift of minus pi by 2. So, this one starts from 0, goes to uh, minus pi by 2 at the natural frequency and minus pi, okay. And it turns out that as the quality factor increases, it goes down sharper and sharper. It always starts from 0. These points are fixed at very low frequencies, it is 0, at very high frequencies, it is minus 180, and at the uh, natural frequency, it is minus pi by 2. Okay? But how rapidly it goes depends on the quality factor. The higher the quality factor, the sharper the curve looks. That also you can get from the expression. But hopefully, these three points you can easily get because at very low frequencies, you can neglect these altogether, you have a real positive number. So, the phase is 0 degrees. At very high frequencies, you can neglect these two and if you substitute S equals J omega, you get minus 1 by omega square L c, a negative real number. So, the phase is 180 degrees and at the natural frequency, this cancels with that. So, you have 1 over J, which uh, corresponds to a phase of minus pi by 2. Okay? So, these things will be, I mean you guess obviously that the phase of these and the magnitude of these will be important when we use negative feedback around it. Otherwise, it is probably not that important. Okay? And how would you choose this uh, natural frequency 1 over uh, square root L c? How should you choose it? Yeah, it should be substantially less than 1 by T s, because what should happen is that your D c component will appear here and it will appear as it is, right? because it is going through a gain of 1. All other components should be attenuated substantially. So, that means that 1 by T s should be here and so on. Okay, somewhere there, where it is multiplied by a very small gain, it will not be eliminated completely, because the gain of this filter is not 0 for any frequency. right? It is 0 only at infinite frequencies, but it can become very small. Okay? Is this fine? So, what do you think the output will look like with the real filter now? So, what we want obviously is a constant DC, constant uh, output with time. of value alpha V s, right. That was the principle, the average of the switched output is alpha V s and we wanted to remove everything else other than the average using the low pass filter. But will the output versus time look exactly like this? What will happen? There will be small ripple. What will be the characteristic of the ripple? It will basically be periodic with T s. The shape and so on we can calculate later, but uh, what you get will be something which will go up and down and the period of this will also be T s or the frequency will be F s naturally, because this part of it is a time varying circuit. But here we have the switched output and that is going into a linear time invariant circuit. Okay? What is to the right of the switches is a linear time invariant circuit and what is the characteristic of a linear time invariant circuit? You cannot generate new frequencies, right? The output frequencies will be the same as the input frequencies. So, the output free output also consists of uh, components at DC, the fundamental 1 over T s, and the harmonics. So, around the DC value, which will be dominant if you design the filter correctly, you will have some other periodic signal. Okay. Or yet another way to think about it is, if you have any circuit, if you give a periodic input, you will get a periodic output. You have to, right? In steady state, so you will get a periodic one. But what you want to make sure is that this peak-to-peak -peak disturbance, right? So let's say you want 1.8 volts. 
you will have some limits. You will, you also know that you will probably never be able to make an output voltage equal to 1.800000 volts, right? It will, it is allowed to vary by some amount. Now, in some cases, it may be plus minus 10 millivolts. In other cases, it may be plus minus one. But whatever it is, uh, it will have some range, and you have to make sure you have to design the filter such that the peak-to-peak -peak value will fall below that acceptable limit. Okay. Any questions? So, we will uh, again uh, please think about all these things. The switches are very simple, but please try to understand how they work. It, they would respond to a logic signal S and in this case, I have used two switches with complementary logic control signals. So, that when one of them is on, the other one is off and so on. Certainly, I mean there are other practical things that come in. One thing you absolutely want to avoid is both of them being on. There will be a short circuit around the supply. Okay. So, those practical things will come later and you have probably seen them in the lab. You have things like the non overlap generator and so on which you built precisely so that the two switches do not turn on simultaneously and then short circuit the input battery. And then of course, the second order uh, linear RLC circuit you should know, but if not please go through the transfer function again and get used to uh, characterizing its magnitude and phase. Okay. And finally, because I mean you can think of it as two parts, one part that generates a switched voltage whose average value is the desired value and the other one which removes all the components other than DC, so that you get nearly a DC. But we also know that you do not get exactly a DC, you will get some variation around this and that is known as the ripple. Okay. So, there is a ripple around the desired voltage alpha V s and the ripple period will be the same as the uh, switching period or the ripple frequency is the same as the switching frequency. Okay. Now, let us say I designed some uh, DC DC converter, I have chosen my L and uh, C and so on and I find that I find that the ripple is too high. Okay. Maybe I want the ripple to be 10 millivolts and it turns out to be let us say 25 millivolts or something. So, what can I do to fix the design? Huh? increase value of L or C and essentially you are making the low pass filter, uh, you are moving it to a lower bandwidth. So, it filters out the uh, filters out the signal. Now, let us say what happens is when you use a larger L or larger C, they are also physically larger. Okay. Now, of course, there is a premium on space, right? you want every all gadgetry to be as compact as possible and so on. So, let us say the values of L and C I have chosen, they are already like physically quite large and I cannot increase them any further. What else can you do? Huh? What else can you do? Yeah, you have to increase the switching frequency. Okay, so that's the obvious thing. It's the relationship between the bandwidth and switching frequency that matters. So you have to increase the switching frequency. Of course, this also does not come for free. It turns out that to turn something on and off. Right now, the switching is ideal. It just responds to the logic signal. But it turns out that the switch itself, if you want to switch it switch it state there is some power dissipation involved and the faster you switch the more power dissipation there is. I am not talking about power dissipation in the switch in the process of switching it. Okay. So, this you know from digital circuits I think. So, if you want to switch something there is some energy that has to be uh, put to change the state of the switch and the power dissipation will be higher. Typically, the energy is the same for a given transition of state let us say from 0 to 1 and 1 to 0. If you want to do it more times per second, you have to burn more power per second, more power that is you have to burn more energy per second. Okay. So, those things will come in and actually a lot of the improvements in these uh, DC DC converters and so on that have happened are because we now have better and better switches which have which can be switched faster and faster. So, that is why the moment you can make something faster, you have higher frequency signals and you can make the passive components smaller. Okay. So, let us say like long back when you could only switch at 10 kilohertz, the L and C the natural frequency had to be much smaller than 10 kilohertz. So, you need very large L and C values. Now, we can probably switch at several megahertz. Okay. So, the values of L and C are correspondingly smaller. So, there is actually a lot of go a lot that is going on in uh, this this whole field where you try to make this DC DC converters and uh, generate different supplies and so on is extremely important. In fact, a modern system on chip 
where there is lot of functionality cannot work without also a good uh, what is known as a power management system okay so there will be these uh, dc dc converters lots of them like there could be half a dozen of them on each chip and also they have to be very compact if you look at mobile the mobile phone it is so thin right and it has uh, very few external l's and c's and they have to be also very small you can't have like very bulky ones so many of them switch in uh, several megahertz range and it's because we have better switches that we are able to do that we can make it more and more compact okay what do you think will happen to the ripple if i double the switching frequency huh eh? no no what i mean is the ripple let's say uh, when i i design this right and i design it for uh, i don't know 100 kilohertz switching frequency and i have chosen some l and c and the ripple the peak to peak value of that is 10 millivolts okay so now i double my switching frequency to 200 kilohertz what do you think will happen to the ripple reduce is fine i mean how much does it reduce huh i mean from 10 millivolts how much does it become will it become zero huh 2.5 why huh 1 by a square so one of the answers is 2.5 millivolts you agree with that i have doubled the switching frequency okay will it get smaller or bigger smaller at least we are in agreement in lot but uh, how much does it get smaller by please think about it it's not that difficult right calculating this how would you go about doing this huh yeah okay so how, what does that mean now 40 decibels per decade that means roughly i mean we are looking for estimates right ah huh, yeah so what is that yeah that's correct so No, that's correct. So, what's the answer? I had 10 millivolts. What's the answer now? <laughs> what's the ripple now? 10? 10 by what? Now, I said I increased the switching frequency from 100 to 200 kilohertz, right? So, and the ripple was 10 millivolts with 100 kilohertz. So, what is the ripple with 200 kilohertz? Yeah, what is that? I mean, you can calculate 1 by fourth of 10, right? It is 2.5 millivolts. That is correct. <laughs> okay. So, it is. why is there so much hesitation to doing numerical calculations i don't understand so it was like this the response of the lc filter will be something like that and you will always design the switching frequency to be design the corner frequency such that the switching frequency falls somewhere here okay so now what i have done is i have moved it 2x further up so if i go by 2x this goes down by 6 dB or 1 by 4. Okay. Now, of course, this is approximate in that uh, there are other harmonics, and the phase of the harmonics also changes. How the harmonics added up changes, and so on. But this is still substantially accurate. Okay, because we first of all we are not looking at a case where the ripple is large. I mean, that's a useless DC-DC converter to begin with. Okay, we have to design uh, the LC filter such that the ripple is small, and in that. a uh, region we can simply look at the strength of the fundamental and kind of decide what's going on because the other ones get attenuated even further right so one fourth is a good uh, estimate so basically the ripple is inversely proportional to the square of the switching frequency so now you can see why it is so attractive to try and make dc dc converters with higher switching frequencies because uh the ripple becomes uh 1/4 or you can use the trade off in a different way maybe you don't want to reduce the ripple at all you can keep the same ripple but with much smaller l and c right that's the idea 
Now, of course, it does not come at uh, come for free, it turns out that there are some losses in the system which depend on the which increase with the switching frequency. Okay. So, you could be taking an efficiency hit if you go to very high switching frequencies. So, you have to choose your switching frequency where it is high enough so that you can use small enough passive components, but it is not so high that switching itself becomes difficult and you are incurring losses in the switching process. I do not know if we will get time to discuss the switching losses and so on, but for now uh, it is enough if you know that I mean you may be familiar with this expression for switching loss in digital circuits. Are you familiar with this C V square f? So, here it is slightly different system, but it is similar in that the loss there is a certain portion of the loss that is proportional to the switching frequency. So, that will increase. So, that can be a problem also. Okay. So, now that is the basic DC DC converter we know how to go from a voltage to a smaller voltage that is we go from a DC voltage V s to another DC voltage alpha times V s and this alpha what is the what controls the output voltage? It is the duty cycle of the switching waveforms. Okay. Alpha is the duty cycle of the switching waveforms and that is what controls the output voltage. So, by controlling it you can get any voltage that you want. Now, it turns out because of the switching process the output is not exactly DC it has some ripple, but uh, that yeah of course, that has to be designed in that is you have to make sure that the ripple is smaller than whatever your whatever your application allows you to do. Okay. And you also know the basic trade off involved uh, the ripple will be inversely proportional to the square of the switching frequency okay. and similarly it is also inversely proportional to the square of the natural frequency of the filter. Okay. You can also reduce the ripple by uh, increasing the values of L and C and what makes the DC DC converters more and more compact is uh, our ability to switch at higher and higher frequencies. So, that you can use smaller and smaller passives when I mean, there is no uh, it is kind of hard it needs a lot of research into materials to make a capacitance smaller. Let us say you have a 1 microfarad capacitance and you want to reduce the size how would you do it? What do you have to do to reduce the size of a capacitor? What are all the things you can do? What does capacitance depend on? Yeah, epsilon area and D that is all right I mean 3 quantities. So, you can find a material with higher epsilon you can use larger area or you can use smaller distance. So, is there some trade off involved with using smaller distance? What do you think will happen? I mean it looks like yeah that is for free right. Increasing area that looks like I am making the capacitor bigger, but reducing distance that looks like in fact I could make the size a little smaller. Maybe even if that is not the case it looks like it is for free I can make what prevents me from making extremely uh, I mean uh, capacitors with very very small distance between the plates. Breakdown. So, if you have very small gap you will have breakdown issue. So, you have to have the distance to be greater than something. So, that you can operate the capacitor reliably. So, that means that you have to have a certain amount of area also. So, the cleverness comes in trying to find materials with uh, very high values of epsilon and then also rolling up the whole thing. So, that uh, even with large area the whole thing can be accommodated into a small volume and so on, but there is only so much that you can do. Okay. Similarly, an inductor how would you make an inductor smaller that looks even harder. What does inductor depend on? Inductance depend on number of turns. Yeah, basically the flux linkage and so on. So the number of turns. If you try to increase it, it will make a become bigger. You can use smaller wires. Maybe the resistance will become too high and it will be lossy. I think also you can use a material with higher permeability, so that will increase the inductance. Permeability is the counterpart of permittivity, right? So that will increase the inductance. But again, these are not. Uh, that easy at least transistors have been improving a lot faster than passive components. So, the if you look at how fast we were switching like a decade ago to how fast we can switch now that ratio is much higher than let us say the size of capacitors or inductors. Okay. So, those are the trade offs I mean that comes into design. So, any questions about any of this how to convert one DC value to another I mean we have not we are not completely there yet that is we can only make the DC value smaller now we will see how to make it bigger, but uh, at least we have some part of the problem solved the, the virtue of this approach is that we are doing it without any loss in principle. Okay. The LV the resistance will have some loss because the wire will have some resistance the switch will have some loss because it will have some resistance 
the switching process itself will take some energy, but still we uh, in principle it is very low loss. Okay. Any questions about any of this stuff? How can the because the switches have been getting better and better. Okay. So, the energy dissipation in a switch essentially depends on the size of the switch. I mean this you can even make a physical analogy right. If you have that the left side switch is much uh, you need lot more energy to switch that than the ones for turning off fan and I mean the bigger switches are you need more energy to operate them. The here also it is similar physically larger it is the more capacitance it will have. So, the more charge you have to put in from the control side for it to turn on. Okay. So, as switches have been getting smaller and smaller you need like smaller amount of energy to turn it on and uh, that is how the switching itself is getting faster. Okay. I mean that is the general story of uh, the CMOS revolution right. What is enabled all these things like you know for us to pack like billions of transistors on a chip. So, that essentially your uh, <coughs> maybe not even the smartest smartphone will have like more computing power than the supercomputers of let us say two decades ago, two decades ago. Okay. So, because you can put more and more transistors it takes less and less energy to switch them. So, you can manage I mean it is not enough to make it smaller if it took the same energy because then the energy density the power dissipation will become so much that the whole thing will melt. Okay. So, that is how we have been able to get to that. So, transistors have been improving very very substantially it is not clear whether that improvement will go on because the transistors have become really small. So, the distances are now in the few atomic layers thick and there is all this talk of I do not know have you heard the term Moore's law yeah. So, what is it yeah there is some it is actually a Moore's observation that uh, the uh, computing power and how many of these things many of these performance parameters will double in certain periods of time. And if you go on doubling essentially you have exponential growth. Now, this is not a physical law I mean it is not like Newton's laws which are uh, which govern uh, motion right. So, but anyway somehow people have been following that and actually uh, trying to make it work and it has worked so far. It is not clear whether it will continue on, but uh, it has gone us like uh, from thousands of transistors in the early 60s to or hundreds to from in the early 60s to billions today right on a single chip. Any questions about this? Okay. So, the next is the other uh, important thing that hey first of all the battery voltage itself was changing like I said uh, depending on its discharge state its voltage is not exactly 3.6 and even the output voltage you may want to change like I said uh, that again you need to know something about digital circuits or, or to appreciate it. First you want to keep the output voltage precise and even dynamically you may want to change it like sometimes you need a higher voltage to operate the circuit faster and sometimes you need a lower voltage. So, that it can be slow it is very easy to see that if you have a processor I mean like your computer it is not operating with the same load all the time right. I mean depending on the program you are running it can be at a very light load if you are not doing anything to very heavy load if you are doing some very heavy graphics processing and so on. So, we have to be able to control the output voltage how do we do that? We have to set it with negative feedback, but before that we need to have a knob to turn which will change the output voltage what is that knob here? Alpha. Okay, so that's the only thing that will change the output voltage. So what? Uh, so let me redraw this. This is S. S bar. Okay. So, S and S bar let us say it comes from another circuit and I will just say switching signal generator and it generates S and S bar which are 
periodic and let us say it has some uh, frequency or, or uh, period T s that is given. Okay. So, this will always be T s and what changes is alpha okay. and s bar will be simply in the complement of this and we will assume that the input to this is alpha. Okay. I think you already know how to make this circuit. How did you do that in the lab? The input is a duty cycle, meaning input is a number alpha. Okay, of course, in reality, it will be some voltage in your case, but there are many ways of doing that. But for now, assume for the switching signal generator, assume this model. Both S and S bar will be periodic signals at a period T s and S bar will be complementary to S. So, the period will always be T s, but the on period of S will be alpha times T s and alpha is the input to the circuit. Okay. So, let us assume this model. How did you do this? How did you make this in the lab? What is that? Yeah. So, essentially you either uh, compare a DC voltage with a sawtooth or a triangular signal. Now, the fraction of the time for which the DC voltage is above the triangular signal depends on the DC voltage itself. right? So, you have a triangular voltage and let us say you connect these two, these two inputs to a comparator. What it does is if the DC value is higher than the triangle, it gives you 1, otherwise it gives you 0. So, now you can see assuming that it is a symmetrical triangle, basically the duty ratio that you get is related to the slope of the I mean related to the DC voltage and the slope of the triangular wave. Okay. Is this fine? Sorry, it is related to the DC voltage and the peak to peak value of the triangular wave. Because if I have a larger DC voltage, it is more than the triangular wave for a larger fraction of the period. Is this okay or no? This is okay, right? This is how you have built it. Well, let us not worry about the details. Basically, we have an input alpha and we have This is output voltage V naught okay. and we know that uh, this L and C are chosen properly, so that it will filter off the ripple. So, let us ignore the ripple for now. So, by changing alpha, I can change the output voltage. Is that okay? Now, what do I do for negative feedback? What should I do? I have to let me make this ground, so that I do not to keep drawing the other wire. Essentially, I have to compare the actual to the desired. Let me call that the reference voltage or V ref. Okay. So, that is the essential part of negative feedback. right? Now, you can compare the output voltage itself or a fraction of it. It does not matter, just like we did in the amplifier. I will for now, I will show it like this. So, we compare the output voltage to the, the desired voltage V ref. Okay, and and then what? What will this do? What do I do with the difference? That's the error, right? What do I do with the error in a negative feedback system? Yeah, integrate or amplify it with a high gain and feed it back where to alpha. Okay. This is the controller, okay? Can be an integrator, or you can think of it as an amplifier. And you have to make sure that the sense of uh, feedback is negative. If alpha increases, the output voltage increases. But if that happens, then uh, because you are subtracting it from VREF, it will be in the correct direction, right? Now, this is fine as a sort of abstract negative feedback concept. We have to implement this. So, for that the first thing we have to do is to make a model of this whole behavior between alpha and V naught. Remember, this is the battery input, 
but as far as the negative feedback uh, system is concerned we have a controller this alpha is the input v naught is the output we look at v naught and through feedback control alpha okay so first we need to know the response between alpha and v naught now we have like more complicated circuit than before before i we had control sources and so on we could write the transfer function essentially now also we need to know the loop loop gain right for this this whole negative feedback also has to be stable otherwise i mean you will get uh, the output voltage may not be controlled correctly so to do that we have to essentially be able to estimate the loop gain and the weird part here is this from alpha you get some switching signals it's the duty cycle that is changing not the output voltage the duty cycle controls these switches and that in turn controls v not so that model we have to come up with and then after that we can do our usual loop gain type calculations to uh, complete the feedback controller okay